The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? On a Sunday morning, I gave a message about God's work in the world taking place through people who work. The congregation was encouraged as I commissioned them that their everyday tasks were part of God's mission in the world. At the end of the service, a woman came up to me and asked if she could have a moment of my time, and I sat on the front row of chairs, and I asked her to share her story. And she said, Pastor, thank you for that eloquent message. We like to hear that. And thank you. I'm sure it was useful for many, but what about the rest of us? I asked her to explain. She said, you see, my husband and I, we're retired. We watch our grandkids. We try to give something in the offering and volunteer time when we can. But you spend all this time talking about value creation and wealth creation and community flourishing. What about the rest of us? Where do we fit in to your plan? I paused for a moment because I didn't want to give a glib answer. And I suddenly realized that her comments and question awakened deeper issues for our faith and work movements. You see, up to this point, most of our movement has focused on white collar workers. But in our mosaic of movements, we may be missing out on being able to be enriched by and empower women and men from all different aspects of life. How would our conversations and concrete actions change if we included retirees? How would our conversations and concrete actions change if we included people with disabilities, not only as objects of compassion, but as people of maximum capacity, enriching our communities. And what would happen into our conversations and our concrete actions if we also included the underappreciated and underrepresented service workers? In Colossians chapter three, St. Paul tells everyone who he addresses his letter to, to do everything for the glory of God. And he was addressing every class, every gender, every ethnic group. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul reminds the Gentile believers that at one point they were far away, without hope, without God, aliens. But now through Jesus Christ, they have been brought near, made citizens, included in God's community of mission. In our faith and work movements, in our desire, in our local churches to mature, We need to move from largesse to liberation, from momentary compassion to maximal capacity of all of the people of God. Retirees need to know that we're not simply saying get back to work or do more or a volume of activity, but rather value those who are called retired, value them as spirit-empowered treasure troves of mentoring as women and men who still have dreams to be fulfilled. One morning, there was a violinist in the church orchestra, and after the second service, he came up to his pastor, and he said, Pastor, will you pray for me for my upcoming job interview? Well, the pastor couldn't hide his astonishment at this request because Jim, the violinist, was 88 years old. And Jim said, Pastor, I know you're surprised, but I am so tired of ageism and age discrimination, they need me at the bank. Well, the pastor, through the laughter and through the joy, did pray for Jim, and two weeks later, he started a three-year stint at a local bank. Now, Jim wasn't financially destitute in his situation. Jim needed to wake up with purpose every morning. It's interesting, we have decades of studies and recent work in Forbes magazine that demonstrates that men and women who work into their eighth and even ninth decade live longer, healthier, happier lives. It's interesting that given reasonable health and reasonable bosses, their finances, their psychology, their relationships are all improved. Wes and Judy Wick lead a ministry called YES, Y-E-S, it stands for Young Enough to Serve. 
And, and their entire mission is to make the second half of life count by empowering women and men to be mentors, to build churches and orphanages, to serve in community organizations, and to really be mobilized for the purposes of God. Moses was 80 years old when he started his public ministry. And he had two chapters of objections to God or why God should choose someone else. And God answered all of them with divine provision, didn't he? By the way, I think there's a missing Hebrew manuscript that Moses put his age up as an objection. The fact of the matter is, God only became upset with Moses when he said, send someone else. You see, for Wes and Judy, for Jim, for Moses, there's no retirement in God's kingdom. Though one may not any longer do paid work, there's only divine reassignment. And again, that's more than a volume of activity. But imagine if we begin to embrace and empower and engage those who have so much to offer the next generation. Well, a second group for the rest of us are those with disabilities. Tom Landis has been in the restaurant business for two decades, and he owns 13 restaurants. And he's discovered that the restaurant business is not about food. It's about people. It's about getting good employees and serving the customers well. And in an industry where turnover can be 300% per year, he has found it important to get skilled and loyal employees. And he's made it an aim in his Texadelphia restaurant right here in Dallas. He's made it his aim to employ women and men on the autism spectrum and with Down syndrome. And he discovers that they are skilled and capable workers. In fact, one of his cashiers, Coleman, says, I love my work. It's who I am. And I just realized when I heard that quote that in one sentence, without an MBA or a seminary degree, he gave us a theology of work. In one sentence, he gave us not the whole of being human, for we are more than our work. But he tells us that we are made to accomplish and create and add value to the world. It's interesting, the Bible is full of narratives of God using people that were not part of the majority culture. Jacob the patriarch encounters the Lord God, becomes Israel, and walks with a limp. The Apostle Paul, this great apostle who healed and delivered many, himself walked with affliction. Now sometimes, in that foretaste of the kingdom of God that we've been talking about, sometimes God does do miraculous things and bring a great amount of wholeness and healing to physical and mental issues. Most often, however, God seems to get particular glory working through human limitation and that interdependence of each of us finding each other's capacities and helping each other cross different finish lines in our lives. Amos Young, professor of theology and mission at Fuller Theological Seminary, has written an incredible book called The Bible, Disability in the Church, A New Vision for the People of God where he challenges us to read the Bible in light of disability. And then he's written a second book recently called Hospitality and the Other, where he continues the conversation of Miroslav Volf and others, helping us to embrace and receive, but not only as act, for compassionate purposes, but to embrace and receive the capacities of all of God's people in Jesus' community of reconciliation. The rest of us includes retirees, who bring value. The rest of us includes those with disabilities who can help a company's bottom line. In fact, Puget Sound Enterprises out in Washington State, they actually network with public and private agencies to place capable people with disabilities into places of employment that improve a company's bottom line. Their goal is to help companies truly embrace diversity by looking beyond the label. You see, Women and men who are retired, women and men who are struggling with disabil disabilities are living parables of dignity and diligence, passion and purpose. One day in Phoenix, Arizona, a bunch of us professors were taking a break from our very busy seminars and enjoying poolside uh, service at the restaurant. And my friend Johan noticed that a server named Angela was particularly adept with her orders and tables and so cheerful. In fact, she and her manager were walking by and Johan said, come here. And you've got to know Johan, he is a 
big guy with a big heart. He said, I am really worried about you. You are enjoying your, you're enjoying your job too much. Angela smiled when the laughter died down and said, I love serving people, and I love bringing joy to my customers. Well, Angela is the exception to the general American rule where a vast majority of workers dislike or hate their jobs on a daily basis. And this is especially true for service workers who are unseen and underappreciated. The people who clean our homes and offices, the people who help raise our children, the people who serve us food, the people who will serve us in our retail purchases. Access to prosperity is often only a dream for them. Porter Braswell works at a company and has created the company called Jopwell. And in his company, his goal is to help African American, Native American, and Hispanic professionals find jobs in the tech industry that so often has been closed to people of these populations. He says, I am so happy that I get to help people go from surviving to thriving. But he knows it takes educational skill, it takes ethics training, it takes discipleship, and it takes an entire infrastructure to help people move into their full capacity. My question for us, as we try to help service workers, these workers who often feel hopeless, who have to live in crowded conditions, will we convene wise Christians and talk about changing the infrastructure, about adding opportunities, about recognizing how much these folks have to offer? We must become people of intentional inclusiveness. And we must become people that really welcome everyone, the rest of us, to all that we're doing. It's so important that retirees are honored and released to fulfill their dreams. It's so important that people with disabilities are seen not for their disabilities, but for their capacities. And it's so important that the often unseen, underpaid, unappreciated service workers are received into our communities and allowed to reach maximum capacity. Tom Landis, our maverick restaurateur, is opening Howdy Homemade Ice Cream. I just like the name. I want some right now. <laughs> and it's almost lunch. We really want some ice cream. He said, we're all about amazing ice cream, but even better people. He's discovered that women and men with autism make outstanding food, food preps because they love routine. He's discovered that cashiers with Down syndrome do an excellent job. He wants to change the way people see people with disabilities. He wants to change the way businesses do business as he receives the rest of us into his restaurant. And by the way, he's not operating a charity. His bottom line is improved. I believe that our faith and work movements are part of an emerging awakening, a genuine spiritual awakening that we've been longing for for two centuries. By the way, this awakening that's coming is not going to be one ecstatic bonfire. It's going to be millions of brush fires as women and men, house by house, parish by parish, business by business, become intentional disciples of Jesus Christ. I wonder if our inclusion of retirees, I wonder if our welcoming of people with disabilities, I wonder if our attentiveness to those in service industries are some of God's holy preconditions for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I pray it is so as we believe the gospel and faith work and economics applies to the rest of us as well. Thank you so much.